So I'm going to be talking about Encompass, which um, is uh, our term for a palliative system that we've employed within the UK NHS, uh, within St Luke's Hospice. And Encompass stands for the Enhanced Community Palliative Support Service. And that's what it's all about. It's around the community delivery. And this work has actually been uh, undertaken through uh, an organization in the NHL called Clark uh, within the region of Yorkshire and Humber. And the executive director for that organization is actually here, uh, Professor Sue Mawson, and has brought some brochures that are available here and at the back, I believe. So if anybody's interested in learning more about the work of the Clark and, and, and its role and how it relates to engaging with uh, academia and with industry and healthcare, I'd really encourage you to, to go and talk to Sue. Uh, but Encompass is um, an initiative approach uh, using eShift. Thank you. And so it's when you look at Sheffield, uh, Sheffield is an area in Yorkshire and Humber in the middle of the country. And it's an area with very high palliative care needs. Um, Sheffield's known as the steel city. And any of you that have seen the film The Full Monty, that was actually filmed in the city. Uh, it has a very high level of health inequality. Um, so there are some very affluent areas, but there's also areas with very high uh, deprivation. It's a population of over half a million people, 1% of whom die each year. So it's about five, over 5,000 people die within the city uh, area. Uh, we only have two palliative care providers. There's the Macmillan unit at the Sheffield Teaching Hospital, uh, which is an 18-bed unit. Sam, you, please correct me, you know the data. And we have Sam's uh, facility, St. Luke's Hospice, uh, which is 20 beds, inpatient unit, uh, with the therapies and rehabilitation center and the community team, uh, which was originally when we first met and started working with Sam, it was primarily all band seven. So it's senior experienced palliative palliative nurses uh, that were working in the region. Now the challenges for palliative patients in the area is that there was a very limited supply of inpatient care, so as you can see we only had a very small number of beds, but also community-based care as well, there was a very limited uh, range uh, provided for them. So the challenges were, were sorry, we moved on, yeah. uh, the challenges were that uh, if their symptoms escalated, then uh, the parents and the carers were, and, and the uh, patients themselves were unable to cope. So they would fo phone for an ambulance and be admitted and go in through the emergency care, uh, emergency room. And then when they got admitted to hospital, there was a lack of resources and support for them to be able to go back home afterwards. So we had very extended stays in hospital and sadly the hospital became the default place of death and that's where nobody wants to spend their final days. Next slide. So looking at the tr uh, traditional community care model, this is the one that Patrick presented earlier. Um, what we found was we had the one-to-one, um, -one, so we had go going out into the community, the very experienced band seven specialist palliative care nurses from the hospice. And obviously this is a very expensive model when they're providing this one-to-one -one care and is very difficult to scale. But the problem is that there's a very, very limited uh, number of these specialist nurses available. And when you're trying to recruit, the chances are you you actually will be recruiting and taking them away from somewhere else. It's not a case you're hiring in from another uh, uh, elsewhere. You're actually stealing from one of the other providers. And the other problem is when you're actually trying to train these individuals, there isn't a natural progression. Um, the only way you can really do that is for a, a more junior nurse to go out with a senior nurse, which actually increases the cost even further. So for them to get that level of confidence and, and skill and to be able to be independently in somebody's home and provide the care required, it was a, a very complex model and couldn't continue. If we can move to the next slide. So the Encompass approach was, as you've seen earlier, the idea of expanding cap uh, the capacity of the existing nurses using technology-enabled approach. And within that, uh, they've, we've embedded uh, the palliative outcome uh, scores, uh, the way of actually assessing uh, um, all of the palliative measures, the pain report, uh, patient reported information. So the specialist nurse works remotely, as you've seen before, and they're monitoring, mentoring, and supporting the junior nurses in this model. So we're actually uh, two grades down, band five nurses, who traditionally could not go out and work alone in the community in a patient's home. 
And what we're finding now is this system is allowing them to safely and cost-effectively support patients in their own home. And it's created their own grow-your-own training program. They're able to develop their, their Band 5 nurses uh, and give them the skills and the confidence to be able to deliver the care. So this project uh, has been uh, nearly three years in, in process now, hard to believe. And, and obviously we did a lot of preparation in advance of that. Um, so we started out getting baseline data. We had our first wave of nurses that started training and went live uh, beginning of Jan it was January 2016. And then in March, we went fully live. We decided to do the pilot first just to get people used to the idea seat because it was a brand new implementation within the UK context. We wanted to make sure everything was right before we moved into a full implementation. So we then went fully live from the uh, beginning of March. So the data I'm going to be showing uh, when you see at T1, T2, those are the time periods shown there. So findings. This is what I was alluding to earlier on when I was asked about the evaluation. What we found is now you'll see a significant increase in the band five nurse visits. This was a role that didn't exist prior to this po uh, project. So these nurses were unable to go out into the community. So we're now seeing, even in a short time, six months, 286 band five visits. We're seeing a reduction in the number of consultant visits, the uh, physician, and in the um, joint visits as well. So we're seeing quite a, a change in the, the profile of the visits. And bearing in mind this was only till September, we're actually uh, collecting new data and that will be available shortly. And we're expecting to show that there's actually been an even greater uh, increase and in change in the uh, visit types. And what you'll see here, again, this is quite early data, the blue columns show the visit times of the visits taken place by the nurses. So you can see um, that it peaked at around one o'clock in the afternoon, um, but where there were fewer visits earlier in the morning because the nurses were having to go back to the office to get their files, to get all of their information, to uh, chat with their colleagues before they could go out into the home and uh, conduct their visits. And then we're going back and doing the documentation. The red columns are actually the data from March to September. So again, this is a little older. We, we will have updated data shortly. But what you can see is that the visits are now occurring far earlier in the day than they used to. Um, so what we're hoping is to see is that there will be a transition and the number of visits will increase into the afternoon. Um, but at the moment, you can see already that there's been a transition to the time that the visits are able to be, uh, take place. We've just started looking at some of the qualitative data. We've uh, just held uh, focus groups and interviews with uh, a number of people at St. Luke's uh, to get their experience. And some of the experiences they're talking about is around data entry. And it was interesting that Patrick was talking about using um, uh, tablets and phones to actually uh, submit the data. Well, in the hospice setting, it was interesting that the nurses there actually preferred to use laptops because as the quotations here show, that they, they, when they started using phones, they had patients commenting that it looked like they were texting. So they felt a little uncomfortable with actually using smartphones, but were more comfortable. They felt it looked more professional if they had a laptop in front of them. But it just shows you how agnostic this technology actually is. The fact that you can either use it on a phone, as on a tablet, on a laptop. So it's however it suits your professional practice and your way of working. And it may be that some of the nurses were using them in different ways within the same organization. Next one. Um, again, interdisciplinary working, um, there have been a few interesting comments that have come up. And they can say that they can actually access information from other team members that have been out. So you can see here, I can, as a delegator, divert anybody in the team that's got their phone or laptop back to that patient I saw the day before, because they can access what I've done and the history's in their hands, so it's useful. So they've, all, they've got all the current information to be able to make decisions, even if they weren't the person that last saw the patient. And the quality of the assessments as well. And the fact that they're now doing these uh, outcome scores and e-shift, the fact all this information is available to them in one place makes it uh, a lot more, there's more structured assessment that's undertaken. So they're actually saying that they're getting a higher quality of assessment. But I think one of the things that um, 
was most interesting to us was looking at the impact that this has had around hospital admissions and lengths of stay. NGH is a very large general hospital, um, so it's Northern General Hospital, and you can see that uh, that had the highest number of admissions. So typically uh, in 2015-16, there were 3,441 admissions, but that represented overall a 4.2% drop in admissions from the previous year. Um, the Western Park Hospital, WPH, that's a cancer specialist hospital. And while there were only a small number of admissions there, it's only 700, you can see there's a slight increase in the percentage, but that's because we think, we're still doing some of the background investigation, we think that's because it was around very targeted interventions. These were planned admissions. People were going in for very specific reasons, having procedures, having um, tests uh, conducted, and then uh, being discharged. So these were shorter, and so we're, st we're still looking at this data right now. But overall, significant reduction in the number of admissions. And what this table actually shows you is for the 1,500 hospice patients, uh, just over 1,100 were admitted to hospital, um, and uh, they had a total of 4,548 admissions. And we sort of look how those are broken down. And what we're seeing is that the total time um, per acute patient in hospital has reduced by 5.64 days. Now, this doesn't sound like a big change, but when you actually look at the numbers, if everything else stays the same as it is now, if you assume that the admission rate stays the same, if you assume that the funding rate stays the same, for 1,156 patients saving 5.64 days, that's over 6,500 days, which is, equates to 2.4 million pounds in savings for 1,500 patients in one area with one hospice. So what we're seeing is a significant saving, not in the community sector, but we're actually seeing that saving being made in the acute sector. This will obviously create challenges for funders and commissioners because then you have questions about how things are being funded. But at least this gives you some evidence to go and have those conversations and, and start that discussion. So the benefits of this approach, obviously we're all talking about the fact you have synchronous online information available, which improves coordination and it improves communication significantly. It's supporting interdisciplinary working by different providers because we can have acute working with community, working with third sector or charities like hospices. So you can get them working across different organizations, but you can also have them working across different professions as well. So you can have, as we're finding with the hospice, we're having clinicians and uh, senior physicians working with senior nurses, junior nurses, and we're hopefully going to as uh, assistance shortly. It's supporting more delegated care delivery because at the moment with um, St. Luke's, we're working with junior nurses, but again, as I say, we're hoping to go to assistant pr practitioners. And in Canada, we're seeing that it's actually working with care aides as well. So different uh, levels of um, staff. And it's facilitating timely and seamless care delivery, and that's been absolutely critical. So opportunities for the future. We see this as a way of uh, solution for the acute sector bed blocking issue that we have right now. We have major problems uh, with patients being admitted um, like everywhere else with chronic conditions and we're unable to get them out into the community because there just aren't those support services in place and so they're having longer stays in hospital and uh, we, we have big problems that we don't have the capacity to be able to, to deal with that. I mean certainly in Liverpool where I'm working we've, we've got a brand new hospital but I think Phil I'm right in saying that it has 120 beds less than the previous hospital that was there so we need creative solutions that are going because we've already got that definition we need to work out how we can be creative and actually uh, work within those constraints. So we're talking already around early discharge programs for COPD, for CHF and for stroke. But we're also looking at new delivery models as well for things like post-surgery wound care, where there are gaps right now where you are, normally people are having to go back to the hospital to see surgeons. There's no reason why they need to do that. If we can actually deliver um, services using this type of approach um, in the community, then they can obviously stay locally. 
So hopefully that gives you a little taste of the work we've been doing. And certainly if you've any more questions, please feel free to come and chat to me or to Sam as the medical director at St. Luke's. I'm sure he can give you the uh, consultant's perspective and the organizational perspective as well and the administration and the challenges that they've had in actually putting this in, into place and doing so as uh, successfully as they have. And I'd just like to acknowledge the other members of the team, uh, Professor Sue Mawson, who's the executive director of the Clark, and Dr. Steve Narris, who's actually been the evaluation lead within the Clark for, for this particular project. Thank you.